so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Morgan Rogers uh, from uh, University of uh, Insubria uh, at uh, in uh, Como. Uh, and uh, he will talk about uh, toposis of topological monoid actions. So please. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much to the organizers uh, for accepting my talk. And thanks for a really great conference. Um, I'm looking forward to the last few talks after this. So, um, since we've seen plenty of topos theory uh, during the school and in the talk so far, let's jump straight into it. So first, I'm going to tell you about toposes of group actions. Uh, so we'll start with discrete groups. So if I have a discrete group G, uh, I can consider actions of that group on sets. And so classically, we think of a, an action of a group as a, an operation that goes from the product of my set A uh, with G to A, um, which respects the group operations, um, which is you know just a, a nice alternative way to think of them. Once we're used to thinking of them as uh, pre-sheaves, so I can think of my of my group G as a category with a single object, and then an action, specifically a right action, um, determines a contravariant functor uh, from G into sets. Um, now, because groups are self-dual, um, it doesn't matter where I, whether I treat this so much whether I treat this as uh, a functor defined on G or G op. Um, but the important thing is that this is a topos and the kind of topos that we're quite familiar with. So now suppose that we equip G with a topology tau. Note that I'm saying it this way round. I'm not thinking of G as necessarily a topological group, which is to say a group in the category of topological spaces, I'm, again, working classically and equipping G with a topology. And in particular, this, doesn't, this topology doesn't have to make G into a topological group, um, because all I'm going to use this topology for uh, is for a continuity condition um, on G actions. So if I take my G action, I can put the discrete topology on my set, I have my topology on G, and I'm just looking at whether the action is continuous with respect to the product of those topologies. So because that's just a condition, uh, it defines some full subcategory um, of my category of right G actions, um, which therefore comes with a full and faithful functor. And this functor has a lot of nice properties. Uh, so it's left exact, it's closed under subobjects, which is to say any subset of a continuous any so, sorry, sub action of a continuous G action is still continuous and it has a right adjoint. So um, the left exactness comes from the fact that when I take a product um, of continuous G sets, then when I need to look at an open map in the inverse image, I can take the opens corresponding to the G sets individually and I can take their intersection. And so I can verify the continuity condition for the product. Um, and checking that sub actions of continuous actions are continuous is quite straightforward. Uh, so all I need to really spell out is the adjoint. Um, and this is typically presented like this. So it sends for my G set X, uh, it sends it to the collection of elements uh, whose stabilizer subgroup of G um, is open in the topology. So I, I can just express it as a condition on open subgroups. So, from the existence of this functor with all these properties, I can deduce a variety of properties of this category. So first and foremost, that it's a topos. So I've shown that V is that exact. Um, I don't know why the and is here, uh, but because it also has a right adjoint, that's more than enough to make sure it's co-monadic. Um, and it's quite a classical result that a category of co-algebras for a co-monad on a topos is still a topos. But that's elementary topos theory. We, we obviously want more than that. Um, so we can also check that it's a grid and deep topos. Um, and since I'll be mirroring this argument later, I'll spell this out. Um, so obviously, we've already shown that it's a top, an elementary topos. And so we can think of V and its right adjoint R as a geometric morphism. 
So now what we do is we take the representables in our pre-sheaves on G and we consider their quotients. And the reason we consider their quotients is because if I take any continuous G action X, then it's covered by representables. That is, there's a jointly epimorphic family from representables, and I can factor each morphism in that family via its epimonofactorization. But remember that this subcategory is closed under subobjects, which means that these S's, um, this S and S primed, um, will actually be contained in the subcategory of continuous actions. Um, but because any topos is well co-powered, there's only a set of quotients of each representable um, up to isomorphism. Uh, then this gives me an indexing set. Uh, so basically, I'm taking a subset of the quotients of representables, and I can use those are automatically generating. We also have that the topos is uh, has all of the required properties for uh, Giraud's characterization of greater than deep toposes inherited via this commandic functor. And so everything works out. It's a great deep topos. We can go further. We can look at special properties of these toposes. Uh, so remember that an atomic great deep topos is a topos in, which has enough atoms. So an object of a topos is called an atom if it has no non-trivial subobjects. So it's only subobjects are itself and the initial object. Um, and if I look at the quotients of representables in my pre sheaf topos, then those will exactly be the transitive G actions, um, which in particular, I can't take any sub action, um, which is not trivial because the action is transitive. And so I get all the elements back or no elements at all. Um, and because there's still atoms in this subcategory, uh, we have a separating collection of atoms for that subcategory and that's for that topos. So the final property that I want to mention uh, is that there, this topos has a rather special point. Um, so if I look at my category of actions for the discrete group, then it has a forgetful functor to set. That's the inverse image of uh, a geometric morphism, uh, which is a, a point of this, but it's moreover an essential point because this forgetful functor has a left adjoint. And then we have this hyperconnected morphism, which I've just constructed, um, but which is quite well known. I'm not laying any claim to that. Uh, but I mean, it's a property of this topos that it has a point that factors in this way. And when we get around to more noise, this will be important, which we're going to do now. So once again, if I take a monoid, I can consider it as a uh, category with a single object um, and its right actions form a pre-sheaf topos, just as before. Uh, and these toposes are actually characterized by the existence of that essential point. So it's also a surjective point because uh, this inverse image functor is, is faithful. Um, any mapping between n, n sets is a mapping between the underlying sets. Um, so if I have an essential surjective point of a topos, then I can recover a monoid which represents it. And there are a couple of ways of doing that. The first is to look at what happens to the um, terminal object of sets under this monad here. Uh, and the second is to look at the endomorphisms of this point. Um, and that second way of constructing a monoid will be important later. So now we equip M with a topology. Uh, once again, we don't require the result to be a topological monoid. And we can once again consider the subcategory of our pre sheaf topos um, on these continuous actions. Um, now you'll note that I'm, I've wrote the arrow both earlier and now in this direction. So because this has a right adjoint, this is not an inclusion of toposes. The geometric morphism that we end up with is a geometric morphism going from left to right and not from right to left. So because I keep talking about it as a subcategory, that might be a point of confusion. But what we end up with is a connected, in fact, a hyperconnected morphism. Um, so I've kind of jumped the gun a bit because I still need to prove that this actually has an adjoint. Um, so the first part of the proof is identical. Um, left exactness is, is quite straightforward. Um, the issue is showing, is constructing this right adjoint because we can no longer just take 
stabilizer submonoids because for a lot of monoids, um, sub stabilizing submonoids are going to be trivial. So what we do is we consider what I'm going to call necessary clopens. So if I have a right end set X um, and an element X in that end set, then the M action is continuous of that element uh, if and only if uh, these sets which partition the monoid M um, are all open. So I need to not only look at what happens uh, for, for the stabilizer submonoid, so to speak, when M is the identity element, I also need to look at all images of X under the action. Um, so I can equivalently express that as the requirement that this congruence, um, this right congruence of pairs which act in the same way on at this element X is open in the product topology of tower itself. So finally, um, I need, in order for X to be in um, the sub action, which I'm going to define, I need the action to be continuous, not only at X, but at the image of X under the action of M. Um, and so if I define this, I can check that the adjoinness properties are satisfied. And so I have two different ways, both in terms of necessary clopens and in terms of these open congruences to describe this right adjoint. But I mean, it's, it's the result of the proposition that's important as far as understanding um, the results that will come next. So before I re-express the analogs of the results in the group case, I need to tell you what the thing corresponding to atomicity is. So we saw that groups give us atomic toposes, but that's not true for monoids. And we need to see um, what the replacement is. So uh, a, an object in a topos is called supercompact. Uh, if whenever I have a jointly epic family over that object, then one of the morphisms in that family is epic. Um, and in particular, if I have a pre-sheaf topos, then the quotients of representables are exactly the supercompact objects. So representables are supercompact, but also their quotients are. This is one of the generalized compactness properties that Olivia mentioned in passing in, in um, one of her lectures. So a topos is said to be super compactly generated if it has enough of those. Uh, so every object is covered by super compact objects. And in particular, because these are closed under quotients, it's enough to talk about super compact sub objects. So skipping straight to the final result uh, by exactly analogous arguments to what we saw in the group case, this topos of continuous actions for M with respect to the topology tau is a super compactly generated grid and topos. And it once again has a point of this form. OK. So having gotten that far, we've learned something about these categories, in particular that they, are, they have all these properties. Um, we start to want to use these more lines with topologies uh, as the basis of bridges in the style of Olivia Caramello. So we want, to, we want to be able to identify when a topos can be expressed as the topos of continuous actions for some monoid, equipped with a topology. So I'm just going to present some questions that one might ask on the way to getting there. Uh, the first is, suppose I have this setup, uh, but I don't know what tau is. I only know that it's a topos of, act of it's a category of continuous actions for some topology. Can I recover that topology? And immediately, I can say the answer is no. So for example, if I take the real numbers here, um, the continuous actions of the real numbers on sets are rather boring, because it being a connected monoid, uh, it has to act triv trivially on all of the elements of the set. And so if I equip, equip R with its usual topology, then I just get sets here. This, the resulting category will be equivalent to the category of sets. Um, and so the best I can hope to do is recover the indiscrete topology in that case. Or, you know, I can't tell which topology I started with anywhere between the ordinary topology on the reals and the indiscrete topology. But there is a best answer. Uh, and to understand what it is, 
we need to look at some other objects in the topos uh, than the quotients of representables. So I can consider left actions of the monoid. We saw a bunch about those in the Edsys talk. Um, and if I take any left action and I apply the power set functor, this is the ordinary power set functor, I take a set, I take its collection of subsets, then actually I get a right action on that power set. Um, and specifically in this case, if I take my, my left action to be the action of M on itself, um, I get a right action of M on the power set of M, um, which acts by inverse images. So if I take any subset and I take an element of M, I can ask which elements of my action are mapped into that subset by M. Um, so because I have a power set of M here, and obviously any topology on M is some collection of subsets of M, so they all have they all exist as elements in here. Naively, one might hope that we can recover a topology from this object somehow. And we can. <laughs> so um, here's how we do it. Uh, we consider the object T, which is the image of this power set of M under the co-monad induced by that hyperconnective morphism that we saw earlier. Um, and so this turns out to be a base of Clopin sets for the coarsest topology, tau tilde on M, uh, which gives us the same category of actions. Um, and so I should, since I haven't put the proof in the slides, I should give a word to, to how this works. Um, and basically, it's the fact that if I look at the necessary clopens that we saw earlier uh, as elements of this power set monoid, they interact really well with the inverse image action. Um, and so in particular, if I look at what, uh, at when uh, an, an element A of the power set of M is continuous, I can decompose A into the union over its elements of the image of A under the action of those, under the inverse image action of those elements. Um, and so we get this nice interaction, uh, which allows us to show that whenever something is continuous with respect to this topology, it has to be continuous with respect to the original topology and vice versa. Moreover, uh, what we end up with when we equip M with this new topology tau tilde is a topological monoid, even if the original data that we had wasn't. So, if you were worried about the fact that I was working classically and not considering a topological monoid in the first place, then you needn't have worried because we, any monoid equipped with a topology is canonically Morita equivalent to a topological monoid. And we can do even a bit better than that. So um, if I take the Kolmogorov quotient of my monoid, um, which is to say I identify any elements which can't be distinguished by the topology, um, then I still have um, a, a valid topological monoid um, and it produces the same actions. So if I call uh, a one of these canonical topologies an action topology, um, and that makes sense as a definition because the construction is idempotent uh, by nature, um, then I can replace my original monoid with the monoid with this action topology and then take the Kolmogorov quotient and I get a zero dimensional Hausdorff monoid. Um, so I get a very nice, or at least I get a monoid which falls into quite a specific class. And I call these powder monoids. Um, they're not entirely characterized by the fact that they are Hausdorff uh, and zero dimensional, um, but those are some nice properties of them. And so, you know, another way of saying that is that any topological monoid or any monoid with a topology is discrete action Morita equivalent to a powder monoid. And here I'm saying discrete action Morita equivalent because it's more typical to consider topological monoids acting on topological spaces. And so you need to be careful about the specific Morita equivalents that you're talking about when you're discussing this with people. So here are some examples. Um, I'll skip straight to pro-discrete monoids and groups being examples. Those are quite nice. Uh, if you look in sketches of an elephant, the, uh, the process that I've just described amounts to the reduction of a group to what Johnson calls a nearly discrete group, where the intersection of all the opens 
contain of all the open subgroups um, gives the identity, uh, and plus there's a, a second condition. Um, and here is the kind of classical example that gives us the Chanuel topos with the automorphisms of the natural numbers, but where the topology is taken in terms of the stabilizers of finite subsets. All right, I'm just going to speed on because I have a another question I want to cover, which is suppose I have a topos of this form. That is, I have a topos and I know that it emits a point of this form without loss of generality. I can put this monoid in the middle here um, because, like I said, the existence of a point, uh, an essential surjective point characterizes these. But the question is, if I have a hyperconnected mor geometric morphism from a topos of discrete monoid actions, what can I say about this topos? I mean, is it the topos of actions of M with some topology? The answer to that turns out to be no, but we can find a topological monoid which represents it. So um, remember the supercompact objects which generate this topos because they're the quotients of the representables in uh, the pre sheaf topos. They are exactly the principal M sets with a single generator. Uh, and specifically, they're the ones which are continuous with respect to tau. So therefore, we get a site of those objects. Uh, and we can index those objects by the open right congruences of, of M with respect to this topology. So the right congruences, which are open with respect to tau. Um, so what we're going to try and do is reconstruct a representing monoid for, um, for E from the endomorphisms of this canonical point, right? Or this point that we're assuming exists. Um, so what we have to do is reduce the, the data of such an endomorphism to the data of uh, the components of natural transformations defined on that generating subset. Um, and we can reconstruct a monoid uh, by looking at the underlying sets of these um, principal actions indexed by the right congruences. And the reason we need to index by the right congruences is so that we have this ordering which we can take the um, projective limit with respect to. Um, so actually, the multiplication on L is inherited from M uh, just because the naturality conditions ensure that um, any endomorphism of this point has to interact well with the images under the quotient maps of elements of M. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's where this expression comes from. It's essentially compressing the data of endomorphisms into a form that can be expressed in terms of these quotients. Um, and if we equip this with the pro-discrete topology that comes from the expression of L as this um, limit, then we get a uh, topological monoid, which represents this topos. So a word of caution here, it's a pro-discrete topology but this is not a pro-discrete monoid in general, um, which is quite an important distinction to make. So, because I, we have this representation theorem, uh, and we know that any topos of continuous actions of a monoid has a point of this form, um, we arrive at this final result that a topos is equivalent to the topos of actions of a topological monoid on sets, if and only if it has a point of this form factoring as an essential subjection followed by a hyperconnected geometric morphism. So um, there is a, a final point here to be made, which is L isn't the same as M in general. And so we get the idea that this L uh, is a completion of M. Um, and indeed, whatever M was, it emits a monoid homomorphism to L. Uh, and we can say that the monoid is complete if that's an isomorphism. Uh, and, and then we get a nice characterization of power the monoids as those for which this comparison uh, monoid homomorphism is injective. So obviously I haven't presented that many specific examples. Uh, so here is a counterexample, uh, which Olivia gave me uh, at the, a time when I thought the power the monoid should coincide with complete monoids. If we take the integers with addition, and I equip them with the topology having these uh, prime power subgroups uh, as a base of opens, uh, then they form a nearly discrete group. 
um, which is a special case of a powder monoid, which I mentioned earlier, but it's not complete. Uh, indeed, its completion is the group of periodic integers. Um, so it's nice that this completion process does give an intuitive notion of completion, uh, at least in this example. Uh, I have some further highlights, uh, but I think I'm out of time. So uh, I am just going to stop there. And uh, thank you very much. Here are my references. Okay, uh, thank you for your talk.